I haven't even said anything yet. I'm going to take a picture of y'all because you look great. And I wish you could see what I'm seeing. Okay, but that means, Jeff, you have to smile for the first time. All right, one, two, and War Eagle. That's a good way to start. Also reminds me to put my phone into mute because I don't want to be doing push-ups for everybody. Okay, it is wonderful to see all of you. Uh, most of you, I, uh, well, most of you I don't know, actually, because uh, I haven't had a chance to, to meet you. So, hello, I'm Chris. And for, all right, motivate, I know you. Uh, I would like to start off, as I always do when I teach uh, classes over at the College of Business, with, with the AU Creed. Um, it's a good way to start, it's a good way to end, because it's a reminder of who we are and what we do. And I'm not going to stand there. Uh, <laughs> So what a great document, you know, written in 1947, uh, not long after World War II. And um, it's a lot of great beliefs, which really form the values basis of what we at the Auburn family represent. And over time, if we embody these, those values turn into our family culture. It's not perfect. I'll admit that human beings aren't perfect. But as we continue to strive to live by these beliefs and values that becomes our culture, what we're really doing is striving to serve something greater than ourselves. And to me, that's what the AU Creed is all about. But I guess we got to do professional development, which pays for our breakfast, I suppose, and being here. And uh, what I'm going to do is spend about 30 to 35 minutes or so uh, really just talking about developing and uh, sustaining a winning team. And, but I want to start with a quote from Mark Twain, who said that there are two most important days in a human being's life. That's the day that they were born, and then the day that they discover why. So rather than throwing up a whole bunch of bullets on my background and bio, don't get nervous, I'm not going to jump on you, but I prefer to be out amongst the team. Um, I just want to talk about my story as an introduction, and as I go through today's talk, we'll get into a little bit more about a purpose and a couple of times in my life when I discovered my why. This is a picture of my grandfather. It was taken probably about five years after he was liberated from a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And I remember growing up having deep respect for this, this man. Uh, as a child, uh, he taught me how to fish, was a mentor for me on, on a great number of things. And at the age of 12, I was at Fort Rucker with my family. We were observing a change of command ceremony. My grandfather had been retired by that point for about 10 years. And there was general officers that were walking by and saluting him. And so imagine a 12 year old kid and you're, you're seeing this and he wasn't in uniform, he was in civilian clothes, right? And so I asked one of my uncles, why are, why are these generals saluting grandpa? And he said, well, son, your grandfather's a hero. And that got me to asking, well, what made this man who I have so much admiration for a hero? And then I learned he was, uh, he was in the Philippines when the Japanese attacked, and he was battlefield promoted to company commander, which means his commander was killed. He became the commander. And, uh, and what he did for, for about a month and a half uh, with, with very little supplies uh, was nothing short of remarkable. He was awarded the Silver Star sometime thereafter, uh, but survived captivity. He says it was his faith his belief that there was something greater out there for him. And uh, thank God he survived, or you'd have some other knucklehead up here talking right now. <laughs> so uh, that top left is a picture of me. Um, yeah, hoorah. Semper Fidelis. Marines have a strange language of understanding how to communicate with one another. <laughs> we just said a lot, and you don't even know it. So, uh, <laughs> But this is me seven months ago, I guess. It was May 13th uh, at my retirement ceremony. And as, as I mentioned, or maybe, maybe you didn't pick up on it, but uh, that man in that picture below is what I wanted to be. That's what I wanted to be. And so I did. And uh, this rank insignia right there belonged to my grandfather. And I was honored to be promoted with, uh, with his rank insignia, who also retired as a colonel. And uh, that was a good day, good, happy day for me. But uh, let's jump into some other, some other things here. Who 
has ever lived in the state of Texas? <laughs> okay, a cu couple of folks. In order to claim your yourself as a true Texan, there's one place in the state of Texas you have to visit. And what is that? It's the Alamo. I loved growing up in Texas. From uh, the seventh grade to the 12th grade, that's where I lived, that's where I grew up. And there's just something about the great republic. It, the flag is always just a little bit lower than the American flag, but not by much. And uh, the Alamo is a war fighting spirit. It's a spirit that is not afraid. Does that sound familiar? And it's about never giving up and always, always fighting for what you believe in. So that's, that's where I grew up. It was pretty cool. And then in 1986, at the age of 15, my parents took me to the Cotton Bowl. That's right. I know. Now I just told you how old I am, right? <laughs> So I will never forget this, okay? We went to, the, now both my parents were Auburn graduates, and I didn't really know much about college football and all this, that, and the other. But we're standing there uh, about to enter the stadium, and I hear these drums beating, and I hear this music playing, and I see the spirit march for the very first time, march right in front of me. And you see the majorettes, and the flag line, and the pom-poms, and the drums, and the playing of the music, and then they start to do the War Eagle song, and I'm like, that is awesome. And then I got to go into the stadium and watch Bo Jackson with my own eyes catch a pass and run 73 yards down the field. Okay, Auburn lost this game, but I didn't care. <laughs> I was hooked, and that was it. So between the ages of 12 and 15, I kind of found my why. I wanted to serve my country just like my grandfather did, and I wanted to go to Auburn University, and that's exactly what happened. So I came here and uh, from 1988 to 1992, had the time of my life. Uh, I was in ROTC, I was a pole vaulter on the track team for a couple years, and uh, just learned what really the AU Creed was all about. I learned that if you want to become something successful in life, you have to put in the work, the hard work. I learned that having a sound body and a sound mind was paramount for success. And quite frankly, it built the foundation for my future adult life and loved every minute of it. Graduated in 1992, became a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, and thus began my last three decades of my life, uh, honestly. But the Marine Corps is also very strong values-based, honor, courage, and commitment. And over time, those values become a part of who you are, just kind of like the creed is, you know? It's nothing you can touch or put a finger on, it just becomes who you are. So now here I am. Put on a little bit of weight since I uh, retired. That's okay. And, uh, and I'm privileged to be the director for human resource development. I have an awesome, awesome team that, uh, that are here, here today. And I still have the opportunity to teach uh, leadership and professional development a couple, couple of classes each term over in the College of Business. So, so there you have it. That's, that's my introduction. Hello, Chris Ritchie. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to transition just a little bit into this concept called a, a crucible, all right? Um, Jeff explained it to me better the other day, but I can't remember. But if you just imagine something being broken down to its purest form, and in order to get there, it's, it, takes, it takes some hard work. It takes some melting and some pounding and things of that nature. The Marine Corps has something called the crucible as well, and it's a completion of 13 weeks of significant training, very difficult training, and it culminates after all this stuff that you can see here, you know, 54 uh, hours, uh, several days out in the field, very limited sleep, very limited uh, food, kind of simulating what we would go through in combat. And at the end of this, all, all these 13 weeks are called recruit. You're, you're not being a Marine yet, you're just a recruit. When you crest that hill, your drill instructors are no longer yelling at you. They welcome you and they give you your Eagle Globe and Anchor for the very first time. And you are now a United States Marine. You've undergone the crucible. Right? His eyeballs are sweating because he remembers it well. <laughs> in, indeed. So, uh, you know, it's not just the military, though. Uh, in uh, 2002, a uh, Harvard Business Review wrote an article, uh, a couple of really famous leadership authors here, and they talked about leadership crucibles, or crucibles of leadership, if you will. And they found after studying 60 top leaders that that's an interesting thing occurs when somebody goes through a challenge in time. You either are destroyed by it or you grow from it. And so good leaders, they deal with it by finding meaning. Why did this happen? How can I improve myself through this process? 
am I just going to go down a path of being bitter, which takes you to the path that leads to nowhere? Or do I look at how this makes me better? It's one letter in the alphabet, but it makes a world of difference with your mindset. So how do you find meaning in this? But they found that the very top business leaders realized that through this experience, and transformed as a human and as a leader, and that becomes a part of a leadership philosophy that they can be grounded with. It becomes their, their personal compass of what they believe to be right and how they want to lead. So that takes me to my first story today, which was my first leadership crucible. So it was five years after graduating from Auburn, and I'm a platoon commander in South Carolina. And I'm responsible for a, a long-range radar surveillance uh, detachment or platoon, if you will. This is long before 9-11, okay? So any opportunity that you got to deploy and do anything was a welcome opportunity. And our squadron was given a pretty important mission, counter-drug operations in South America. And everybody wanted to go. There was three platoons total, and only two of them got to go. One had to stay behind. And we had to send our best people because this was a very important mission and we could not fail. So some of the platoons were kind of moved around a little bit and we had the, the best quality Marines at doing this job were the ones that deployed. The ones that stayed behind were either in receipt of orders, like myself, I was supposed to PCS to Georgia. Um, I know it's, nobody wants to hear that word, right? But Fort McPherson, which doesn't exist anymore. So I had uh, two months I was gonna be leaving some other folks were in the same boat, so we couldn't send them to South America. Several of them were injured, and honestly, um, a lot of them just weren't as good or proficient as the ones that we sent. So that was the world that we were in. And one week after they all deployed, Headquarters Marine Corps said, congratulations, your squadron is now gonna undergo a combat readiness evaluation, which is not an easy thing to do. And this man to, uh, to my left uh, was my commanding officer at the time, Brian Dingus. We're still in touch to this day. A, a, a person who was humble, kind, caring, sincere, a great mentor, everything that you would want a boss, boss to be, okay? And this, this combat evaluation came. And at the time, if your organization failed, the commander was fired on the spot. And we're like, oh no, not, not Colonel Dingus, you know, forget about that. And we tried to get out of it. They said, no, nope, you're stuck, you're doing it. And we're like, well, okay. So he calls me into his office, says, Chris, I don't know what we're gonna do, but please just don't fail. <laughs> Cause I love my job. <laughs> I said, all right, yes, sir, I'm on it, no problem. So I went and I pulled the platoon together, this kind of ragtag folks, this platoon. And I tell you, if I had a mirror, this is what they would have been looking at. <laughs> Aside from White Christmas, probably my favorite Christmas movie still of all time. But this is what they saw themselves as. And it was really sad when you think about it, because this was the unhidden message that we kind of gave them, not intending to, but that was the, that was the unspoken message, if you will. So my goal here at the time was to show them that this is who they really were. And they were, honestly. Because here's the, here's the professional development for today. Every human being, every human being, especially if you live in America, has potential. Potential to be extraordinary, honestly. And what you'll find is it's the leaders that help encourage them and help bring out their full potential. And if you bring out the full potential in individuals, your team collectively is unstoppable. So that was our goal. <clears throat> we had two weeks to do it, all right? So this is, this is how we began. We began by training hard, very hard. We built a, uh, a test, we did a simulation with a computer, which in 1997 was really, really hard to do. Uh, and we started to run through what we expected the evaluation to be. And we failed so many times, it was getting a little bit scary. But we continued and we got better and better and then came proficiency and then it got to the point where we we're like bring it on we're ready for this and then there's um empowerment i think that's a superpower okay for for people that have uh, have others that are a member of their team if you can empower them with greater responsibilities i promise you they'll grow into those responsibilities 
for sergeants, if that's all you treat them as in the Marine Corps, that's all they'll ever be. Empower them with responsibilities of a staff sergeant, that's what they grow into becoming. And that's kind of what we did. We had to break this one platoon down into three and basically grab three sergeants and said, boom, 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 you're now the lieutenant, you're in charge of this section, here's what we expect, and you're gonna do well, ask me if you got any questions, go. And they did great. Acknowledge um, is something very important because if you're not visible as the leader, if you're not engaged with, uh, with your team and understand their highs and their lows, well, you're not leading, quite honestly. And uh, it's always important to recognize stellar work and achievements. So at the end of this, Marines were given awards, certificates, not everybody, because you don't want to marginalize that, but it's an interesting dilemma because the people that get rewarded, they don't stop. They try harder the next time because they like getting recognized. Those that don't get recognized understand the value of hard work and what we, and what we, what we value. So it grows, everybody elevates their game. And then there's mentorship. Mentorship to me is all about relationships. It's not about the boss mentoring a subordinate and how to do their job. It's about that subordinate mentoring the boss. It's about peers mentoring one another. It's about sharing life's experiences with each other. Before I started here, I thought Jack Daniels was a good whiskey <laughs> until David Hall taught me that there's a whole new world to bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and if you stand in line for a long time, you just might get a bottle of Blanton's. And, uh, and so Michelle hates you, by the way, for what you've unleashed, but that was mentorship. And it's kind of funny, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's true, hoorah. And the point here is it doesn't have to be about the job. But when you see your teammates talking to one another, sharing life's experiences on the job, off the job, job performance, personal things, that's where teams really grow. I mean, they just completely expand. So that, that is kind of what we did for two weeks. And, um, and it was hard. Evaluation came and went. And that's what we ended up with. My boss did not get fired. <laughs> and we celebrated the fact that our little ragtag team of misfits made the highest score that that squadron had ever achieved up until that point and ever has ever achieved since. Highest one on record for Marine Air Control Squadron 2. So that's where the team principle started to, started to morph itself into my brain housing group, okay? And then it was uh, three years later, I went on to my, my uh, next job in, uh, in Atlanta at Fort McPherson. And then I went to this uh, career level school and they, we read this article about the top reasons why military servicemen and women were quitting. They were like, I don't want to serve anymore. They were leaving in droves. This is 22 years ago. And as I read the article about the top reasons why people were leaving and reflected upon that experience, that story that I just shared, uh, that's where the team principle was created, all right? Train, empower, acknowledge, and mentor, and how that becomes so important and mitigating any people, anybody that's disgruntled or is questioning what, whether or not I want to stay with an organization. So this is kind of in reverse order. So the, the fourth highest rated uh, reason why people were leaving the armed forces is because they had a lack of a job challenge. They weren't challenged. And this is where I think the T part of the team principle train comes into play. Um, it's, it's so important to send our teammates off for professional development. Uh, even if it's a, it's a week or so. It may even be the most challenging week that you're experiencing in your job. But if you don't do that, then you're not giving anybody the opportunity to grow. And it's a little bit of a change dilemma, if you will. I'm not going to call you out, I promise. But I kind of just did. <laughs> so it's a, uh, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of a dilemma that you don't want to send the best performers because you need the best performers where you are. But if you don't send the best performers and if it doesn't hurt a little bit with the people that you send for professional development, then you're probably sending the wrong people. HRD just did this two weeks ago and it was brutal when two of our three teammates were not here. But the return on investment is going to be significant because now they've got something that they've learned and we're going to hold you to accountable for that. So get ready. It's coming. All right, action mapping in the house.
but you're going to learn, you're going to grow, you're challenged, all right? And that's what, that's what the, the train aspect is all about, okay? Lack of responsibility, the third highest uh, marked reason why people were leaving. Uh, this is where empowerment, again, that superpower comes into play. So empowerment, if you're not careful, could be a double-edged sword. Uh, for example, if I give you the job to do something that requires you to type, right? And I'm standing right over here and I'm watching you as you're typing. I'm like, nah, no, not, no, nope, change that word. Nope, okay, good, man, good job. You were empowered and I appreciate what you did. Is that empowerment? Nope, micromanagement. So here's, here's where it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you empower, you let go, they're gonna, they're gonna do everything they can to impress you and do the job. But if you, over, if you micromanage and stay on top of them, you've created a self-fulfilling prophecy and you're not empowering at all. So they're not growing. And you certainly aren't gonna have, make them feel like they have a job responsibility, all right? So the uh, second highest uh, rated reason why is uh, lack of recognition. What a tragedy. Lack of recognition, seriously? The second highest reason why people were leaving? Here's where acknowledgement comes into play, and it doesn't take much. Mike, are you back there? Thank you for getting all of this up and running, because you're the center of gravity today. Without this, there's no pictures, and I'm just flabbing my gums, you know? So thank you for this. That's acknowledgement. Also certificates, spirit awards, some other things that you know, may be coming. Um, it's all, it all goes into acknowledgement. And I'll tell you probably the most important aspect of acknowledgement is when you see a teammate who's down, not having a good day. Talk to them and ask them what's going on. And you just may find that you're gonna help positively influence another human being. That's, uh, it means you gotta listen. And so Henry Noem, wrote about this some time ago. He was a priest, wrote a few books. He said, you know, I used to always get very irritated because people continued to interrupt me from doing my work. And then one day I realized it's the people that are my work. And that changed things for him. And he started to have an impact, make a difference. All right, what do you think the number one reason is? <laughs> not, not in the military, man. <laughs> we know we're, we're not ever getting that. Look at that. Lack of confidence in their leaders, their uninspired leaders. So that, that kind of hurt me when I read that. But man, do I fall into that category, you know? Here's where mentorship comes into play. So when I was a lieutenant, I did not have a mentor. There was a program that every, every uh, captain was supposed to have a lieutenant as, as their mentor, mentee. Of course, there's a lot more lieutenants and a lot fewer captains. I was one of those guys, wasn't selected. I, I guess I was on Misfit Island, I don't know. But uh, my mindset completely changed with that, that every, every human being in an organization deserves your mentorship, because it is. And people have found that there are those that achieve extreme greatness that never really were given a shot or an opportunity at the beginning. And that was not the individual, that was the leader's fault. Mentorship fosters that communication, builds trusting teams. So there you go. Now you all are thinking, that's great. That was a study that was done 22 years ago, and it was a military study how does that apply to me? 